privilege of ours this morning to gather with people who seek you. We come into the sanctuary, actually we woke up and we got dressed up in Christmas best and Advent purple. But we have come with great anticipation, not to distribute gifts or to flutter around with last minute preparations. We came here this morning, Lord, to be joined with Magi and shepherds and the angels and the Holy Family at the birth of Christ to gather in the presence of Jesus and to worship you. Give us that perspective today. Let everything else that's going on today just sort of fade into black into the background and bring forward the center of what we are doing here today, the birth of Christ, the presence of the Lord, and the great anticipation for the movement of God among us. And we gather with great joy on this day uh, because we recognize uh, world-changing, life-altering event has happened, an epic-making event. No other religion, no other god uh, has the reputation that you do. Uh, one that so passionately loves his creation that he tore away the boundaries that separate him from us and stepped into it. And didn't did come in power and strength to shake or to, uh, or, 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 or to um, sort of display and bring fear but came in great vulnerability, was found beneath the rib of a virgin, was born to us. That mystery let it settle in on us for these next 48 hours, so that we might breathe it in and ponder it, and like Mary, take it all in, to be present in these moments, to ponder them deep in our hearts. And we gather together today, and we offer up our praise, we hail you as Messiah, we recognize that the name of Jesus is, is not magic. Uh, it holds in and of itself no special power, except that when we call on your name, the Trinity is available to us. So despite what it is that we're suffering, despite what it is that we're going through, despite what it is that we're struggling with, we call on the name of Jesus, and the presence of God happens to appear, is born into those situations and circumstances that we, uh, well, that we hold dear. Uh, our world is spinning, and much of it is spinning awry. It's, uh, it's spinning a little bit off course, and we recognize that on the global scale, but it also happens to us in our homes and in our families. Uh, we don't only see the devastation that sin, the curse of sin, has caused, uh, but we also recognize the redeeming flow of grace. For if you were to let this world spin in all and of itself, if you were to withdraw your grace, we would certainly implode and self-destruct. But because of your mercy, which are new every single morning, we are called the children of God, and we are sent out to bring light and hope and peace. And so today we pray for those who are struggling. I'd ask particularly that you would draw with those, uh, draw close to those whose emotions and uh, mental states are in flux right now. Uh, there's, a, there's a vast temptation for us to, to engage fully in the joy and then withdraw into deep sorrow all at the same time. Lord, for those of us who, uh, who understand that this is the most wonderful time of year, for others this year, uh, this time of year brings with it devastating memories. Uh, and, and deep sense of loss and pain. But we don't want to be ignorant of other people's pain. We want to come up alongside of them and put our arms around them. So that the story that's now being written in their lives is a story of my heart aches because I'm, there's an empty table. There's an empty seat at the table. My heart aches because my loved one is deployed. My heart aches because uh, there is distance, there is separation. My heart aches because our relationships aren't what they're supposed to be. And and God in Christ, through the ministry of the church, came alongside of us and started to fill that aching need. Not that that changes the grief, but it gives a great sense of support and a great sense of hope. And after all, that's why you're sending us. And so we want to be those people. We want to recognize loss today. We, pre we think particularly of the, um, the Bouchard and Silva family and the loss of John Silva uh, this Wednesday. Uh, we pray today that the... The ministries of the church and the relationships that have built over time would be relationships that draw a family back into the presence of Christ, into the community of faith. 
that, uh, that this loss that they feel right now um, doesn't constitute an end so much as it opens up new beginnings, uh, opens up fresh new perspective, and, and allows a new recreative work of God to happen in the lives of those who breathe and mourn. And we think of the Silva Bouchard family because that's the most recent loss. But, uh, but we reach back into last year at this time, and the year before that at this time, and the year before that at this time, and we recognize that, uh, that as, we, as, we, as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord, and we remember why you came, our, our hallelujahs are often mixed with uh, lament. God help me. God fill me. God draw near to me. And so, Lord, we pray for those who are struggling physically, we ask particularly that you would draw near to those who are struggling financially. We pray for those who are struggling relationally. You know, uh, it's the most wonderful and romantic and special time of the year. And yet when our relationships are struggling, we look back over uh, where we are and those who are nearest to us. And we say, man, if only there was, if only there was a moment where the forgiveness would flow and restoration would come up. And we say... Heavenly Father, that you would step into those situations and areas and places, and that the greatest gift that we ever receive today would be the gift of another loved one's mercy and forgiveness and grace. And the greatest gift that we share this Christmas season would be the gift of mercy and grace and an opportunity to start over, that we would reestablish trust and that we would begin to um, move in, some, in ways that, uh, that, that restore and well reflect what you said when you said, a new command that I give you love one another. Because it's you who demonstrated love for us. Loved us so much that you sent your one and only Son to which we celebrate this morning. Be with us as we tune our thoughts and our attention to all that you're doing in our lives. Um, give us opportunity to hear the story in all kinds of new and different ways. In music and song. Uh, to read about the story. To hear others elaborate on the story. To explain the story ourselves. To be captured in the story as it's projected on television screens and movie screens or read throughout literature or heard in the poem, we ask, Lord, that you would, um, that we would be a people who are formed and shaped by the story, that we might live it out in the day-to-day -day ins and outs, the normal kind of monotony and the forgottenness of life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Unfortunately for us, the character of the Virgin Mary rarely gets attention by Protestant folks. At the very least, I will say that she most certainly fails to get the adequate attention that she, uh, well, the adequate attention that she properly so deserves. That's the least that I would say. Regrettably, one might even get the impression from Protestant evangelicals that if the, the whole gospel story could easily and quite sufficiently be told without any mention of the Virgin Mary at all. Jake and Roger, they met in fifth grade, and since then they became the very best of friends. Roger, he was a, he was a devout Roman Catholic, and Jake was the son of a born-again Baptist preacher. Neither of them, thank God, allowed their religion to get into the way of their friendship. They've been friends now for nearly 40 years. Well, they were traveling home together from one of their children's sporting events when they were struck by an oncoming car, and both of them died instantly. But much to their delight, the Lord Christ himself greeted them at heaven's gates with a warm embrace and began to show them the joys of their eternal reward. Not long into the tour of heaven, Jesus stopped to uh, greet a beautiful young lady. Then the Lord turned to the Baptist and said, Jake, I'd like to introduce you to my mother. Seems you two have never met. Maybe today is a good day then for us to sit there and introduce ourselves to the mother of the Lord, to hear her story and to get to know her a little bit better. Small town girl growing up in the backwater of Galilee in a little known town, just a few hundred people called Nazareth. An interesting piece here, there, there, are probably, there are more people who are in, currently in Caleb Kaufman's graduating class at East Providence High School than there were in the whole town of Nazareth when Jesus was born. The senior class at EP High is about 300 and, what, that's about 300 people, a little over 300 people. <coughs> yep, 300, almost 400 people. Yeah, the town of Nazareth was probably about 270, 275, you know, according to the census taken by Caesar Augustus. Life was difficult and demanding in the Galilean desert. Mary had to grow up fast. By the time she was of middle school age, that's 12 or 13 years old, she had already been promised to the carpenter for his wife. Everyone reminded Mary how lucky she was to be pledged to be married to Joseph. He's a good man, they reported, from a godly family. He's going to treat you well. But what does that really mean, actually? I wonder if Mary even knew who Joseph was. Did she love him? I don't know. Uh, what did he will be good to you even mean? Was there a distinguishable difference between the wife of a carpenter and his domestic servant? I'm not sure. Domestic, uneducated, underprivileged, she was lucky to have been chosen by the carpenter to be his wife. Mary spent those long days waiting for her wedding, busying herself about household chores. Uh, she was assisting, ready to take the reins of her own poor family. She was practical, uh, learning the practical skills of cooking and sewing and upkeep. And she probably spent the last few hours that day gathering just enough water to boil over an open fire to help her mother with some laundry. And there she turned the linens over and over in a large pot sitting on an open fire with her hands. Chipped nails, caked with dirt along the under edges, calloused, worked and dry. She swipes wisps of black hair from her face, streaking her forehead with the ash that's accumulated from the fire. Her dark, dark brown eyes, the color of coffee grind, set against a, a, a snow-white field, were scanning her village for any signs of movement. Her eyes unfazed by the wind-blown smoke. Of all of her weekly tasks, helping her mother with the laundry, probably her least, un, uh, least favorite, most unpleasant. Still, there, turning laundry in a boiling pot, a song emerges from her heart. Like the young shepherd boy David, singing along the Israel's hillside pastures decorated with sheep, Mary's voice also rings out among her labor a sweet song of faith and praise to God. Hers is a simple faith. It's pure. It's genuine. You remember what was said of David, don't you, the shepherd boy? 
He was a man after God's own heart. Perhaps something similar could be said of the Virgin Mary. She was a young lady after God's own heart. And in that small, underprivileged town, on an ordinary day about her regular business, Mary is suddenly startled by the presence of a stranger, the likeness of whom she had never imagined before. The stranger addresses her directly, breaking all social protocol and customs. In fact, it would be extraordinary for a stranger to enter a town and approach an unattended middle school-aged girl and strike up a conversation. But as it turns out, extraordinary was exactly what Gabriel wants to, the impression that Gabriel wants to make. I wonder myself if Gabriel waited to hear the end of the song. How long he kind of waited out of sight to see her graceful movements and to hear her voice giving praise to God. Or maybe in his excitement, Gabriel interrupted her right away. Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord, Yahweh, is with you. Startled and a little bit embarrassed, not knowing that she is singing to an audience. And Mary, of course, wondered what kind of greeting would this be, and what does that stranger want anyway? Practically speaking, Gabriel overstates his greeting quite a bit, actually. She may have the voice of an angel, I don't know, but on the surface there was nothing about this young peasant girl to suggest that she was either highly favored or remotely special in any way. I wonder if you remember the Old Testament story of Gideon. Just nod if you, just nod if you don't, that helps me. Just get I remember the old, the old Testament story of Gideon, right? Gideon was the man who was chosen by God to save his people from the, the, the persecution of the Midianites, right? And in the story, the angel approaches young Gideon and he says to him, Greetings, mighty warrior, the Lord is with you. That's his greeting. It's not a common greeting. It's a greeting of honor and respect. It's a greeting that recognizes unseen greatness. This is the exact same kind of greeting that Gabriel offers to Mary. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary had to wonder if Gabriel had made a mistake. If he was looking for someone who was probably a lot more important than her. But then he calms her fears by addressing her by name. Fear not, Mary. Fear not, Mary, you see, of all of the eligible women in the whole wide world, God has chosen you to bring his son into the world. And you will name him Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God himself will give him the throne of his ancestor David, because her pledge to be husband, Joseph, was a descendant and of the line of David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary's response is classic and totally understandable. How can this be? Hey, mister, you might not know, but it's impossible for me to be pregnant at this time. Gabriel probably says with a big smile, maybe even a giggle. You know what? That's funny because your cousin Elizabeth said the exact same thing six months ago. And in three more months, guess what? She's going to have a baby boy. <laughs> This information about Elizabeth is important for Mary to know. Because if what Gabriel's saying is true, that legitimizes his true claim. If, if her cousin Elizabeth is in fact pregnant in her old age, everything's about to change for Mary. Things get real very, very quickly. No more dreaming and daydreaming about how things could be if God would just act. It appears that he is acting, and he's acting now. The angel presents an opportunity to play the lead role in world-altering events. And the only thing the angel needs to know to proceed with God's plan is this. Are you willing? Are you willing? Time to put that song of faith that you're always singing into practice and join with God to help save your people and redeem the whole world. Gabriel's not asking, are you ready? Because after all, who's ready? No one, ever, right? If we're waiting around to do something great until we're ready, it's never going to happen. The question is not, are you ready? The question is, are you willing? Are you willing? She responds, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to what you have said, or according to your word. Now this response right here, here I am, 
the Lord's servant. Let it be done unto me according to all that you have said. This response moves Mary from an obscure peasant girl to a primary place of significance in the gospel story. As much as Protestants want to skip over this part, without Mary, there's no Christmas, guys. Without Christmas, I mean, you can do the math and figure out what happens next, right? She plays a dominant role in the gospel story. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done according to me. Uh, let it be done to me according to your word. This is the response that moves her from the fading pages of irrelevancy into a permanent fixture in God's redeeming work, cementing her place in history. And regrettably, we Protestants take very little time to consider Mary as a model of faith and loyalty. And we often fail to marvel at the wonder of God who chose a girl of middle school age from a peasant town with no name. You know, the Old Testament has zero mention of Nazareth at all. It doesn't even recognize it as an established town. And when God considered who shall be the one to bring my son into the world, he looked past all of the privileged, all of the educated, all of the well-resourced, all of the safe and proper people. His selection of Mary, in his selection of Mary, God chose the foolish things of the world to confuse the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the powerful. He chose what is lowly and what is despised in the world and the things that are insignificant to belittle and minimize and humble the proud, the capable, and the well-off. Because you and I, human beings, I do this too much. I, I look at the unimpressive outward appearance, and I, and I try to understand the hopelessness of the context, and then I make a snap judgment. But God, He looks through the surface of it all, and He sees the heart of the person. <laughs> We think the odds are stacked against her, and we forget that with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. When others see a shepherd boy, God might see a king. But when others see a peasant girl, he might find in her a warm, safe place to call home. And I've been wrestling with these questions for days now. What do you suppose God thinks about when he sees a young, single woman? But what do you suppose that God thinks about when he sees an awkward boy with a developmental disability? What do you suppose that God thinks about when he sees a young girl with Down syndrome? What do you think God thinks? What do you think he sees when he sees a poor child raised by a single mom doing the homework in the laundry mat while the family clothes are drying? What do you think God might see in that fourth string player sitting on the bench of your team who will never really see a second of significant playing time? What might God see in that retired couple who, whose fixed income limits their mobility in this world, but whose health limits their involvement in the kingdom? Can God see anything important or value in them? What might God see in the hardworking father working himself half to death to put his kid through school, or the young grandmother who's working really, really hard to tend to all of her grandkids. See, human beings, we look in at a poor newborn infant wrapped in rags and shivering in a barn and we dismiss him, but that would be a big mistake. Human beings look at the outward appearance, but God sees the, the significance of a person that we have given little value. God sees in that person partner, a co-worker, a kingdom asset, and begins to put that person to work. The invitation goes out. Will you join me in the restoration and the recreation of the world? See, I don't want to wait until you're ready because that will never happen. What I want to know is, are you willing? Are you willing? Now, this can be really great news for us if we're willing to join him in his redemptive adventure. Or, like too many, we could become a reflection of what others think about us. We could adopt the story that our culture tells about us. And we could miss our chance to partner with God in His redemptive work. You see, I think it wouldn't be that difficult at all, really, to read this story and to recognize how extremely passive Mary is in the narrative. Mary doesn't do a whole lot here, right? She is not really acting so much. She's being acted upon. 
So that we could easily highlight her meekness and her submissiveness and her humility. It, it's hard to read this story in a way that makes Mary little more than a vessel, right? A supporting actress at best. A necessary means to a divine end. And we reduce Mary to a mechanism that God uses to bring about the Christ child to the earth. In fact, we've done this. And we're really, really good at this. In fact, we have done it so well, painting this picture of Mary, that no little girl grows up and wishes to aspire to be like Mary. Have you noticed? Who grows up and says, I'm going to be like Mary, the mother of Jesus? I mean, we hear people who are maturing in their faith, and they want to be like Peter, or they want to be like Paul, they want to be like Moses. Nobody says, I want to be like Mary. We point to heroes of faith. And we say, man, I want to walk on water. And I want to heal the sick. And I want to part the sea. Almost nobody says, I want the responsibility of bringing God's son into my world. What if? What if God chose Mary not because of her meekness, not because of her submissiveness, and not because of her humility? What if those are just byproducts of her real character? that which God sees, the sort of intangibles that don't appear on the pages of written scripture. What if God chose her instead for her inner strength? What if God chose Mary for her mental toughness, her emotional stability, her faith, and her courage? What if those are the reasons that made her a proper home for the coming of the king? How does it change the story if we start to think that Mary was not simply a mechanism that God used to bring the Christ child to earth, but rather God chose Mary to be his co-worker. He chose her to partner with him in the grand work of saving the world. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. The angel offers Mary an opportunity to play the lead role, the lead human role, in world-altering events. God seems drawn to an insignificant teenage peasant girl of an obscure village. He's seen her faith and he knows her heart. She has wisdom, mental toughness, emotional stability. She has courage and gifts and talents and abilities that God can use to change the whole world. The only question that needs to be answered are you willing? Are you willing? Not are you able? Not are you ready? Are you willing? And what if God's invitation to Mary was not simply to lay aside her meager life as the wife of the carpenter, but what if the invitation really was an invitation to co-create with him in his redemptive plan to work in the mission of saving her people and redeeming the world? Doesn't that change the story? At least a little bit? And what if we, you and I, what if in response we thought less about walking on water and healing the sick and, and imparting the sea? And what if we thought a whole lot more about becoming people who share God's Son with our world? What if we look, what, what if God were to look down right now at our small, insignificant little church, made up of simple, normal, normal, average people. And what if we found somehow, some way among us, a person of extraordinary courage? Or what if we found you a mental toughness, or emotional stability, or great faith? You know, what if we looked past what everyone else sees on the surface about you and what everyone says about you when you're not here? What if we looked past all of that and discovered that he was drawn to the warmness and the kindness and the goodness of your open heart? And he said, I can use that person to change the world. I want you to play the lead role in, in, in bringing your whole world to a place of peace and hope and joy, and love. Perhaps maybe, in these the next few days, these 24, 48 hours, we might hear Mary's story in a brand new way. I hope that maybe we can begin to see her in a little bit of a different light. And, and I wonder as we sing the songs of the season, as we read through Christmas passages, 
You know those times when our hearts are still and the house is silent, those rare times when there's nothing on but the Christmas lights, right? In, in those moments, or, or maybe when we decide to pack up the nativity scene for another year, if in some normal event of everyday common existence, we might allow ourselves to suddenly and unexpectedly be arrested by the angel's words of invitation to join God in playing the lead human role in world-altering events. And I wonder in that moment if you'll exercise courage, if you'll display the grace, the strength, the wisdom, the mental toughness, the emotional stability and the faith, not to shrink back in fear, not to hide behind a list of reasons or excuses, but rather to stand with Mary and simply say, here I am, I am the Lord's servant. May it be unto me just as you have said. Here I am, the Lord's servant. May it be unto me according to that plan. Let's pray. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings. Ring. Come to us, abide with us, our Lord and coming King. We pray, Lord, that the words of our mouths and the thoughts, the deep thoughts and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our great rock and our redeemer. Amen. You stand with us and let us sing our closing response. Season. God bless you. You are dismissed.